Nelson Thomas, <laughs> how are you doing? Um, I'm doing a lot better. Um, I'm doing good. I'm smiling. Uh, let me take this brace off real quick, get a little bit more comfortable. Whew. Uh, I'm breathing, and that's all that matters. I'm here. You are. Take me back to the challenge. You're on top of the world. What was it like? What was the challenge like? Man, that's hard to wrap up, but if I had to wrap it up, it was a dream come true. I never thought I would be on the challenge. I never thought that I had the opportunity to travel to nine different countries from South Africa to Thailand to London. And not only that, <laughs> I found a purpose. Well, I thought that was my purpose. And um, I loved it. After college, you know, I got this phone call saying, hey, do you want to go on a challenge? I'm like, what is a challenge? I've never even watched the show. I thought it was a dating show. And to keep this short and simple, I did a dating show with Jerry Springer. He did um, Baggage on the Road on Game Network, and that's how MTV saw me, because I ended up winning that. And that's when my reality TV just kicked off career. And I walked onto this challenge, and I'm thinking, okay, this is a party. But then I go into my first elimination. Oh my God, the lights were on me. It was like Friday Night Lights. Everyone screaming at you. You had the crowd up there. You had your teammate beside you. And I ended up winning that elimination. And that's when my challenge career took off. And I've done nine seasons. What was it like in that world? You were on the top, top physical form, great looking guy, all this publicity. Was that hard to handle or did you love it? <laughs> at the time, I loved it. I've never seen nothing like it. When I got off that show, my social media went crazy. I walked around, people wanted to take pictures with me. I'm, kids are looking up to me. Older people are just like, Nelson, we love you, we love you. I'm like 26 years old, I've never seen nothing like this. And then it really hit me when I was with my friends and I was out and people were literally coming up to me crying, saying, we love you. And I'm like, wow. But they don't tell you about all the backlash. They don't tell you how people have their eyes on you 24 seven. You can't even make a mistake. You can't even jaywalk without getting in trouble. Like you have to change your whole personality and who you are to fit these people's standards because they put you on this pedestal. But they don't realize, man, this was all new to me. So it hit me hard. It was good times, it was bad times, but it was a lot more good times. Did you almost think I'm untouchable, sky's the limit, this is big, baby? I thought I was Superman. I thought I was untouchable. I thought I was a man. It was crazy, man. Doors started opening up. People talked to me that I didn't even know. And um, I felt like I was on top of the world. I haven't hit the peak of the mountain yet, but I was right there, right there. And um, I thought I was invisible. Was there any grounding force, your mom, your brother, that said, Nelson, you're doing great things. And at the end of the day, really, all that matters is we love you. You know, I made plenty of mistakes on reality TV. And that's one thing about reality TV back in the day. I don't know about now. We kept it raw. We weren't doing it for followers. We weren't doing it for social media or brand deals. We were just being us, kids having a good time, living life. So we would say outrageous stuff, do crazy things, and get judged for it on social media. And we don't even know what they're going to show on TV. We're watching it just like the viewers. So we're shocked. So when I stepped out of line and my mom saw that, she looked at me and said, wow, Nelson, are you serious? That's not who you are. And she was upset with me at times. But <laughs> this show, The Challenge, brought my mom and I so much closer. Like for her to watch the TV and just see me and just smile and laugh and tell all her friends and family, go up there, we're so proud of you. I owe my mom so much. I put it through hell. And to see her smile and be proud of me, it made me the happiest man on the world. No better feeling. So you're near the pinnacle. You are blowing up on social media. Did you get endorsements where people are making plans to sell products and maybe some fitness products? Because your workout program is insane. So you have this great body, great look. Where were you in terms of that next chapter? You know what? And that's what 
that's, that's what's crazy about reality TV. They don't set you up. They don't tell you what to do. You got to go out and get it. So everybody out there that wants to get on these TV shows, realize you're an entrepreneur. Because after that, after they start filming, it's done. It's done. You're a pawn in their game. So you really got to go out there and get it. So while I was filming, I wasn't able to build a career or work a nine to five or become a manager, become a boss, become a CEO. I had to realize, what can I do? What do people like about Nelson? What can I sell? And I thought about it. Forget about what I sell. What am I passionate about? And I was passionate about fitness. I was passionate about health, clothing lines, brands. I was passionate about making people feel good, motivating people. That's who I was. I wasn't a personal trainer. Did I train clients? Yes. Do I know how to work out in the gym? Yes. But I knew I was more than that and I wanted to give back. I just didn't know how. So I developed a clothing line called Level Up because I wanted people to feel like when you put this on, it's time to level up. Regardless of what you're doing in the gym, out there wanting to be a CEO or build your own business, it's time to level up. And then I was like, what else can I do? What else can I be more passionate about? So then I came up with my own fitness program, Nelly T's Training. Let's come out with that. Let's get people that can work out, get people to motivate them, get them out of bed. And then I know I was destined for more and I didn't know what it was and I thought it was a challenge. I thought it was winning. I thought it was getting first place because I got so close losing by two minutes in Thailand. Two minutes from first place, first place. And this, this was a lot of money too, money to change the world, to change, to change my family's life. But it wasn't about the money for me. I was living my dream. So what I wanted to do with that money, if I would have won, is help my friends' dreams come true, give my mom a better life, give back, help the community. I didn't need the money. I was well off. I was good. I was happy. I grew up with nothing. So I didn't need, I need the bare minimum to make it. Did I want nice things? Yes. But did I need it? No. I was living my life and um, I'm still living it. How important is being in the gym and working out for you? Being in a gym is really important. You know, clanging and banging weights is me, but it ain't about that. It's about the growth. It's about the mentality. It's about your spirit. You think about all these things while you're working out. You, either you had a bad day or your day's not going good. So I go into that gym and I take my anger out on that. And I'm not just growing these muscles, baby, but I'm growing this up here. I'm thinking. I'm realizing, you know, I'm finding some kind of clarity in things. And that's how the gym helps me prepare for life. Joe, you're on top of your game. Life is just incredible for you and your family and your friends. Maybe some tough chimes with the challenges and trying to start your businesses. But for the most part, you are the envy of a lot of people. And like, wow, man, Nelson has it made. What happened that night? The night before the crash. Um, that memory is so vivid in my head. Um, it's the worst night of my life. 20 hours before that, I was hosting a fitness event downtown Austin, Texas. Hosting a fitness event, motivating people to get into the gym, eat better, everything. Next thing you know, 24 hours later, typical Sunday out with friends, having a couple of drinks, nothing unusual. Well, that night I had too many drinks and my life changed forever. I what, hit a pillar. What do you remember? What I remember is getting into that car, telling my friends bye and driving. And next thing you know, I wake up and the car is on fire. And I thought I was in hell. I thought I was in hell. Um, uh, I, I literally opened my eyes and all I could see is flames. And I'm like, I'm dead. But then I heard voices, people screaming and um, telling, get out the car, get out the car, get out the car. And I'm thinking in my head, what's, what's going on? Like, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm here. But I couldn't move at first. I would, the door on the driver's side was pinned, so I couldn't go out the driver's side. All I can get out is the passenger side, but I couldn't get out the driver's seat. And then the young lady, Rita, this brave woman, 
comes up to the car and pulls it. And I push the door open. Rita, Abdul, KJ Osborne, um, they're your guardian angels. Yes. So you remember just saying goodbye to your friends and waking up with a car on fire? All I remember that night is waking up and the car was on fire. Then I heard this voice, this woman's voice, Rita. She's saying, screaming, get out the car, get out the car. Then you have this guy named Abdul. Then you have this guy named KJ. And Arthur, everybody's just screaming, get out the car, get out the car. And they finally opened the passenger door and I tried to pull myself out, but I was stuck. My leg was stuck and I don't know why, but my adrenaline hit and I just pulled my leg as hard as possible. And then I pulled myself halfway out the car and they were able to pull me the rest of the way. And I'm just looking up at the sky. God, please, I don't want to die. God, please, I don't want to die. And I blacked out. Woke up in the hospital, friends, families around. My leg is jacked up, my arm's jacked up. I'm bleeding in my lip. I'm looking around like, what just happened? What just happened? And then they explained to me about what happened. The first thing I thought about in my mind and prayed about, I prayed that, um, that I didn't hurt nobody else. That, that accident only involved me and me only. And when my mom said that and my family said that nobody else was involved, I was so thankful. I was so thankful. And um, it, meant, it meant I was hurt. And I was going through a lot of pain that day and it was excruciating. But it, it just, if I would have hurt somebody that night, I don't know how I would have lived with myself. I looked at your social media feeds and you held that for a long time. Um, I don't know if it was just the struggle of shame, frustration, or you let yourself down. People make mistakes. But then when the new year hit, you said, you know what? I'm going to share this. And I'm going to tell people. And this is my story, and I'm going to own it because I got a second chance. What would you say to people about drinking and driving now that you have walked through the fire? You know, we all drink, we all have a good time, we all have a beer or two, we all say, oh, we're good, we're okay, I could take a shot. I've done this plenty of times, but it only takes one drink to, for your life to turn around. And that's all it took, one drink, something I did every other Sunday or every other day. You know, I'm 26 years old, I can handle my alcohol. So I thought. So to everyone out there, please, please call an Uber. Call a friend. Walk home. Sleep where you're at. Do not drink and drive because right now, I'm suffering my consequences and I'm living proof that alcohol is bad for you. You know, it might, you might have a good time, you might feel on top of the world, you might even feel like Superman. But at the end of the day, it ain't no good from it. And I'm not telling you to stop drinking, I'm not telling you to do that, just be responsible. Be responsible. But I'm gonna be an advocate for drinking and driving because when I was going through that in the hospital, you know, my legal team said, Nelson, you can't say anything just yet. I know you want to. I know you want to come out and this is who you are. You've always been yourself. You never hide from nothing. You always just go straight through the storm, but it's not time yet. So I couldn't just come out and say that. And I was like, okay. But then when it did come out, when the articles hit, when social media hit, things got even worse. Got darker. Because at one point, 
when I posted that saying I was in the hospital because one of my friends, he created a GoFund for me, knowing that I was gonna go through hard times, but didn't know what was going on in the situation, just wanted to help me. And he reached out to the community, and um, a lot of people helped me. But then when that article came out, a lot of people thought I took advantage of people. I didn't tell them about the, that I was drinking and driving. But that wasn't the case. I wanted to let them know. I wanted to tell them. But I couldn't at the time. And that hurt me the most. People don't realize what social media could do to a person, especially a person that's in a light like me. I couldn't even go nowhere without people telling me, DWI, drinking and driving, this and that. DMs is blowing up. Go kill yourself. You don't deserve to be alive. People said, go kill yourself? What? People said, go hang me. Go hang yourself. Go hang yourself. I hope you overdose on pills. I hope you die in the hospital. I hope you don't recover from that accident. I fell into depression. I fell into anxiety. And most of all, I hate to admit this, but um, it's easy to get pills. It's easy to get hydrocodeine. It's easy to get any kind of drug from the doctor, especially you're going through pain. I wasn't even going through pain that time. I just didn't want to be here. So taking those pills, I didn't feel nothing. I would sleep all day. And then when I got released from the hospital, I remember that day. And when you get released from the hospital, they send you home with like 40 pills, right? And my mom, luckily, my angel, I love you so much. Because I remember that day I went home, I wanted to take like three or four of those pills back to back. And she was yelling at me, no, Nelson, no, you're only allowed one. And I was in pain. I was in agony. There was tears coming down my eyes. But I knew it was hurting her more, me being in pain. But she knew if I was to get addicted to those pills, I would have been lost. My mom was so struck that I was dealing with social media on my phone. And I would say, Nelson, put your phone down. Put it away. But being in this spotlight, being a reality TV star, you're thinking about everybody else and your image and everything else and what's going on and what am I going to do? I'm walking into the unknown. I don't have no PR. I don't have no lawyer. I don't have somebody telling me what to do. I'm just being me and just trying to take everything on as it comes. And that is a lot. I can't even walk right now. And I don't even know if I'd be able to walk again. But I'm trying to take care of everything else on my phone and not even paying attention about healing process. And then, um, If it wasn't for my mom, I would have been addicted to pills. I would have been addicted to drugs. But she stood there and fought with me every day, every day till the day I can really just be me. And she saw the light. And I was in a dark room for a long time, a dark room. I didn't want to see the light. I didn't want the TV on. I would grab my pillow, wake up, and just scream, scream and cry into my pillow because I didn't want my mom to see what kind of pain I was going through. So I would scream and hold everything in. And I would say, Nelson, it's going to be OK. It's going to be OK. Why is this happening to me? Why me? Why me? Why is this happening at the, this time? I've done everything right. I was going to church. I was, I was a, being a good man. I was being a good role model. What did I do to deserve this? Why? So your mom's an anchor getting you through the storm. But how did you do it? What did you tap into to get to the next day, to get to the next day, to get to the point where you were smiling again and saying, you know what? It's not over. Well, it's no secret. This right here is really what helped me. This was my shield. This was my weapon. You know, I only learned the surface level of the Bible. And I thought going to church, doing a little bit of Bible study, it'll get me through everything. But I really need to dig deep into this and really find the words and wisdom to get me out of that rabbit hole I was falling in. So now, I go to church every Sunday. I do Bible study Tuesday through Wednesday. Tuesday through Wednesday. I have a community around me. I have people around me. My brother Joe Bell, he runs a Bible study, 8.30 to 9.30. If you don't want to say nothing, you don't have to say nothing. If you just want to listen, if you just need a prayer, if you just need some kind of outlet, Bible study group is where it's at. It's a free therapy. 
this is how I got back. This is how I saw the light. This is how I was able to stand up and smile, get back on my phone. It's your boy Nelly T, baby, let's go get it. But it takes a lot of discipline, a lot of courage, and a lot of consistency. A lot of people tell you there's light at the end of the tunnel. But you know what they don't tell you? How long that tunnel is. And it ain't over. This is just the beginning of everything. But I want y'all to know that I'm not here to reinvent myself. I'm not. This is who I am. I'm growing. I'm learning. If you follow me throughout the challenge, you knew what kind of kid I was. <laughs> and I became a better man every day. And thank you to the challenge. Thank you to that network for giving me the opportunity to show people I can be a better man. No matter what your circumstances are, no matter who you are, where you come from, what your background or your ethnicity, you can do it. You just have to believe. And um, I'm living proof. You know, um, one of my favorite verses in here, John 13. I may not know now, but later I will understand. I'm on a path, but I'm not just doing it for me anymore. I'm not saying, why me, why me, why this happened to me? I'm asking God, what is the next step? What do you want me to do? Use me as a vessel to show people, no matter what kind of mistakes you've made, you can make a comeback. You could be a better man, a better person. Tell me about your search for answers for your ankle. You get into the hospital and the doctor tells you what? Man, I've gone through six surgeries and um, <laughs> last year, 2023, around October, you know, I'm doing everything the doctor tells me to do. I'm doing everything where I'm eating good, taking vitamins. I'm going to all my appointments. I'm working out. I'm not pushing myself too much. I'm doing exactly what he wants, written by the book, rule by rule. And one day my ankle starts hurting. And I go to the doctor. I said, yo, my ankle's hurting a lot more than usual. And they do CT scans. And they said, oh, it's nothing. It's OK. It's all right. It's, you don't have to worry about nothing. You're just in pain. So then another two weeks come. And I said, no, something doesn't feel right, man. Something really doesn't feel right. Can we take another look at it? And they tell me, I have a non-union bone. It doesn't want to heal. I have arthritis going throughout my foot. The reason why I don't have any pain down there, because all my nerves are jacked up. The blood flow, it's not getting any blood flow. They hooked, I, that sick surgery, when they took skin from my left thigh, right here, this line, to put right here, to cover this hole so they can hook it up to an artery in my hip so it can get blood flow, which is a surgical flap. And I'm thinking that's the last surgery and everything's good. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. My injury was so severe, it was a 10 out of a 10. And uh, the doctor said, we've seen things like this, Nelson. And we've came a long way, but your ankle does not want to heal. So I was like, okay. I went on social media. Cried. I didn't ask for sympathy. I wasn't looking for any sympathy or any like, it's okay, blah, blah, blah. I was just letting know, I was letting people know how I felt inside and what I was going through. And then um, I had a couple of angels <laughs> slide into my DMs, say, Nelson, if you get to Mexico, we'll give you a stem cell treatment. And that can probably help. So I called my mom. I said, Mom, pack your bags. We're going to Mexico. We went to Mexico, we did the stem cells, waited about three months. Did it help with the pain? Did it help with the arthritis? Yes. But did it heal my bone? Unfortunately not. I talked to doctors from LA, New York, about six, diff six different doctors from Houston to Austin and everyone that said the same thing. Nelson, you got a couple of choices. You can either get an ankle fusion, a TTC fusion, or a word that I wouldn't let nobody say, not one person. I wouldn't even let you think about it, amputation. And then um, it really hit me. It really hit me. Um, I spoke to my brother, spoke to my close friends and my family. I did my due diligence on 
amputation, on ankle fusion, on TTC fusion, then I had to ask myself, what kind of quality of life do I want to live? You know, you know Nelson. I love the challenge. I love to compete. I love to push myself to the next level from mountain biking, from snowboarding, from rollerblading, from kayaking to swimming. That's what I love to do. I love motivating and do all those things that people say I can't do. Let's put it to the test, baby. But unfortunately, I couldn't do that with an ankle fusion because that would have left me with no dorsiflex. And what that is, is mobility in your ankle. My ankle would have been stiff. Right now, your ankle could do this. It can do this, it can do this, it can take impact, it can take pressure, and you can run with it. But I wouldn't be able to run, I wouldn't be able to walk barely, and I'll be in pain throughout, I don't know how long, the doctor said. When you look at your ankle, what goes through your mind? Pain, suffering, tears. So you're at a crossroads. Have you exhausted, do you think, every option available? I have exhausted every option available. And then what's crazy is that um, I want everybody to know I've tried. I gave this a whole year. March 5th of 2023, I gave it my all. I can't look back and say I didn't. A lot of my friends, a lot of people you know, in my circle, they're telling me, Nelson, keep, try keep going, keep going. You can do it. Get the ankle fusion. You don't want to cut off your foot. It's not normal. Like, what are you, like, what are you thinking, even thinking about it? Like, why is that even crossing your mind? But then, you know, I just had to pick up this one more time because I wanted to let you know we all look for signs. And he gives it to us. But we can be hard-headed sometimes. And all these signs, man, were pointing to amputation. They were pointing to getting a prosthetic. And I'm like, God, like, is this what you want? Is, is this is what I'm meant for? And then um, <laughs> life is crazy, man. My swim coach reached out to me and said, hey, I have a friend that wants to talk to you about the prosthetic world, just in case you were thinking about that. Next thing you know, I get on the phone with my friend Mark. And um, he tells me, look, man, I want to introduce you to another guy that has a nonprofit group called Wiggle Your Toes. And I got on the phone with him. The conversation was crazy. We were supposed to be on the phone for five minutes. We ended up being on that phone for 45 minutes. And next thing you know, he gives me a tour. He sets me up with an interview at Autobot, which is one of the number one prosthetic slash self-care place. So I take that tour. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, man. Day comes where I'm taking the tour, and I'm wondering how I'm gonna get there. Like, I, like I can't drive. I'm calling friends. One of my friends is running late. I'm like, all right, let me put this address in. Let me see how far this is. Tell me why this was three blocks away from my apartment. I'm like, God, if this is not a sign, what is? I could literally walk there, and I'm like shocked. I'm like, all right, cool. All right, God, that's one sign. Next thing you know. Another amputee reached out to me, another amputee reached out to me, and then a couple Paralympians reached out to me. And I'm like, whoa. Then I really started doing my research. Then I started opening that door to the amputation world. God, that's a whole new world that a lot of people don't know about. And we've came so far from not being able to walk, run, jump, compete, and do a lot more of the things are normal, getting back to life. Like the prosthetic world is, it's the future. It is, man. And they're doing amazing things. And I'm having all these people reached out to me saying, we want to help you. They put their helping hand, not knowing me, not judging me, not throwing stones at me, not knowing what caused this. They just want to help me. I'm like, God, is this, is this true? Is this, is this real? Prosthetics are expensive. It's expensive. And this last year has been one of the hardest years from hospital bills and just trying to stay afloat. It's been hard, man. It's been really hard. I've, my hospital bills are like $600,000 because I was in the hospital so much. And um, I didn't know, know how I was gonna get through with this. I, I didn't even know if, if I was gonna have a roof over my head in the next year. And um, things are starting to work out and I'm able to be here. 
and it's a blessing. What's your next step? So two weeks ago, I prayed about it. I talked to my mom, and I've decided to have the amputation on March 5th of 2024. I'm going to own March 5th. I'm not going to leave that memory in my head as a bag. I'm going to go in there, my head held up high, and um, and really take it, take that day. What are they going to do? On March 5th of 2024, they're going to cut off my right foot. From the top of the ankle? They're going to cut it off right here. I'll be a below knee amputee. And uh, it's even scary to say that, man, because I remember walking into that office and talking to the doctor. They didn't explain it to me. And I'm like, OK, OK. But when I walked out, what's crazy is that I literally saw someone in a wheelchair that just had their foot amputated. And I was just shocked. And I'm like, can that really be me? Can you really imagine not having a foot down there? That's got to be the hardest thing ever. Like, I can sit here and say it. I can prepare myself. But can you physically, truly see not having your foot down there? It's scary. I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm ready for it, I'm prepared, because I'm up and down with emotions. I'm not going to lie. This morning, I had to go to the gym to work out to prepare myself. Like, Nelson, this is what you want. This is what you want. But it's not what you want anymore. This is what he wants. And I know that's what he wants. I know it. I can feel it in here. I, like, it's not even a second guess anymore to me. But don't get me wrong. If I had the opportunity to keep my foot and be able to run and jump and do all the things I could, if that was a possibility, yes, I would. But I've done my due diligence. I've done everything I can. And now we are here. And I'm here to step up to the plate. And I'm ready to take on this new chapter in life. What's your hope for the future, and what would you say to the people that have followed you, the people that loved you, your detractors, and, and to people that are watching you? You're under the microscope. Ever since you became a star on the challenge, you said that. What message do you want to portray now? To everyone out there that's following my journey, I don't know what the future holds. I wish I did. I wish I could understand it. But I know if I keep him in my heart and I stay true to myself and who I am, I'm going to accomplish great things. And I'm going to help a lot of people out there. I'm going to inspire a lot. And I'm going to do so much more than I ever thought or ever dreamed of doing. This dream's not over. It's just the beginning. Trust me when I say this. <laughs> you see the smile on my face? It's just the beginning. Nelson, thank you for the story, for pouring out your heart. And we cannot wait to see the great things ahead. Thank you for having me.